Welcome and thank you so much for joining us here in Parliament House. My name is Tom Griffiths. I'm chair of the editorial board of the Australian Dictionary of Biography, or the ADB as we call it. And the ADB is um, situated in the Australian National University. And we're here to launch the Quest for Indigenous Recognition project and website established by the Australian Dictionary of Biography. And the ADB uh, tells the stories of the lives of Australians across time. And it does so with the dedicated help of volunteer scholars right around the country. And we have outstanding Indigenous scholars on our editorial board, and we're fortunate to have the advice and enthusiasm of our Indigenous Working Party. These are people from communities right across the continent. And we all believe deeply in public education and the power of telling and listening to true life stories. And it's my honour to represent this talented team as I welcome you tonight. Now behind us, high above us here, is the magnificent painting Red Ochre Cove by the gifted Australian artist Mandy Martin who died two years ago. And Mandy believed deeply and passionately in the Uluru Statement. Her artistic practice, as many of you will know, was often in collaboration with Indigenous artists working on their own countries. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Paul Girawa House, who will be giving a welcome to country. Paul is a senior Nambri Ngunnawal custodian of the Canberra region. Paul, thank you. Thank you so much, Paul, for welcoming us here with such beautiful words and music. Uh, now I'd like to introduce Professor Melanie Nolan, who is the general editor of the Australian Dictionary of Biography and also director of the National Centre of Biography at the Australian National University. Melanie. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Peter. Friends, the Quest for Indigenous Recognition Project is an initiative of the Australian Dictionary of Biography, as Tom has said, in the National Centre of Biography in the School of History at the Australian National University. This is core business for the ADB. The dictionary aims to be a mirror to Australian society. We intend that people, all Australians, can see themselves in the pages of the ADB. And this means concerning itself with the representation of Indigenous people and their history. This project about the quest for Indigenous recognition is a project of historians engaging with the referendum on the voice in a biographical way. The voice is about constitutional recognition of First Nation Australians, and this website, which um, Linda Burney has very kindly agreed to launch, shows a history of the calls for constitutional recognition since 1901. The ADB has an Indigenous Working Party comprised of over a dozen Australian scholars from across Australia, volunteers, each and every one. We are working with Associate Professor Shino Kanishi, an Aboriginal Yarrow woman from Broome, now at the Australian Catholic University, who is leading an Australian Research Council funded project, an Indigenous Australian Dictionary of Biography. Together with the ANU's uh, Tom Griffiths and the absent uh, Malcolm Albrook, and with funding, more funding from the ANU and also from the J.T. Reid Charitable Trust Foundation. They're producing additional entries on Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, which will redress their underrepresentation in the ADB. There are also two books coming out of the project, Reframing Indigenous Lives and a special volume of Indigenous Australian biographies, which will appear in 2024 and 2025, respectively. And this year, earlier this year, members of the ADB's editorial board invited historians and other prominent Australians to explain key historical events in the long journey to the 2023 referendum on The Voice. The aim of the project is to provide well-informed and reliable historical information which is easily accessible online. It sets out to serve as an important educational tool to better inform all Australians who seek to understand the long struggle for Indigenous rights. Each of the 23 key events in the history of the Indigenous rights which have been selected are linked to relevant documentary, 
audio and visual sources, as well as to biographical articles in the Dictionary of Associated Articles. The ADB sincerely thanks each of the authors for their contributions to this project. I know a number of you are here today, including the Minister Burney. We would like to acknowledge the national cultural institutions, including the National Museum of Australia, the, national, the Museum of um, Australian Democracy, the Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, the National Archives of Australia, and of course the National Library of Australia for their contributions and website material. And finally, hopefully, and optimistically in our hearts, we acknowledge the Indigenous Australians and their supporters have struggled for their human rights, justice and recognition since the British invasion of Australia began in 1788. Thank you very much, Melanie. And it's really true that uh, working with these Indigenous scholars right around Australia in telling lives of Indigenous Australians, telling, offering biographies of very different kinds, uh, it's a revolutionary intervention, I think, in Australian history, and it's an enormous privilege to to work with them. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Peter Yu, AM. Peter is a Yarrawoo man from Broome in the Kimberley region of Northwest Australia, and he's Vice President of the First Nations Portfolio at the Australian National University. Uh, we're so lucky to have Peter working at the ANU. He's a greatly admired thinker and Indigenous leader. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thanks, Tom, for the welcome, and uh, Paul, and uh, also Melanie uh, for inviting me here uh, to speak on behalf of the ANU at this uh, launch um, of the, this very important and easily accessible historical information online. Hopefully will help Australians to understand the long struggle of Indigenous peoples uh, I'm also very proud the ANU has uh, unreservedly declared its support for enshrining the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice in the Constitution. But it would be remiss of me not, of course, to acknowledge my dear friend, the Minister, uh, Linda, and also uh, Julian Besser here. Thank you both for being here today to uh, be part of this launch. Um, but uh, as part of, and as part of that support, I guess the uh, it's been the great effort of members of the um, ADB uh, editorial board to bring together all of the various historians uh, and other prominent Australians to explain the key historical events um, associated uh, in the long journey uh, to this 2000, 2023 referendum. But it, all, it highlights the important struggle of our recognition um, that, has be, that has been in the story of Australian nation building so I want to thank all those people who have contributed to their knowledge, their knowledge, their expertise, and passion to craft the words and tell the story of the quest for First Nations recognition. These historic milestones, of course, are not a comprehensive list of the story that all Australians should know. So much could have been written, and so much more must be written. And that is the important aspect of this project. It is significant contribution the Australian truth-telling and has the capacity to grow as more and more stories are recorded. In my mind, it has the potential to be a comprehensive online database to, con to contribute to the telling of Australia's truthful history and unmasking what Professor William Stanner, the renowned ANU academic statesman, termed the Great Australian Silence. If we ever need a reminding that the truthful history of this nation needs to be heard, it is, of course, in the current debate over the referendum proposal. So much of the information and toxic commentary that underpins the No campaign is dependent on the great Australian silence and the distortion and corruption of Australian history. This, this extensive ignorance feeds into what could be described as a schizophrenic sense of modern Australian national identity. For many Australians, the notion of recognising first nation's people in the constitution through an advisory voice, as modest and wholly unthreatening as it is, has given rise to emotions that are difficult to counter when ignorance is so pervasive. Many believe that the voice will give First Nations peoples a legal advantage over other Australians and somehow undermine the principle of liberal democracy. 
This idea becomes, continues to be propagated by those who should know better and against the overwhelming weight of legal opinion, such as the Solicitor General of Australia, who has advised that the voice, I quote, would not pose any threat to our system of government. In fact, it would, he says, enhance our system. For many Australians, the notion of recognising First Nations peoples conjures up a sense that Australian history and the development of modern Australia is binary in nature, good or evil, right or wrong, and the recognition of First Peoples, peoples place in Australia means the repudiation of the qualities of Australian development. This debate has highlighted to me that our voices have not been heard and understood by a large section of the Australian community. And I believe I speak for majority of First, First Nations peoples when we say that we see Australia in all its complexities. We know that Australia is not a simple story. We need to be included and respected in a better Australia. We want to be recognised for our cultural tradition which stretches back 10,000s of years. We need to be part of a nation that is committed to healing and reconciliation to justice. And what we say is that the principle of recognition of the Australians will decide on a little more than a month time the potential to commence a new relationship that can enhance this country for the benefit of us all. The current relationship is not working. We know that because of the continued torment of powerlessness that so many in our community experience. We all know the statistics that tell the devastating story of that torment. We hope that our simple quest for recognition eloquently expressed in the Uluru Statement from the Heart, would penetrate the wall of prejudice and ignorance that Bill Stanner talked about in his famous 1968 Boy Lectures. What we have found instead is that those bricks that hold the wall together are hard to dislodge, particularly when prejudices of settled Australians inherited from the colonial era are continually reinforced by mainstream political leaders power brokers and the people who hold positions of influence. A recent speech by former West Australian Governor Malcolm McCusker in Perth about The Voice highlights the issue. He says in the speech that he is not arguing against the case for either the yes or no campaign, but the people listening or reading the speech, which has been widely circulated, were left in no doubt about his position. And let me just quote from the opening of his speech, and I quote, it has become customary, if not mandatory in Australia, to preface any speech or meetings by a respectful acknowledgement of the people who lived in the country for thousands of years before the arrival of Europeans. This is very fitting. It is, I think, also fitting to respectfully, respectfully acknowledge the pioneers who established modern Australia as a stable and prosperous democracy, an envy of the world, and the visionary leaders who strove to create a society which grants equal citizenship to all its citizens in a vibrant multicultural country. McCusker's message here is to reinforce the binary view of Australian history, that recognising First Nations people somehow involves a repudiation and diminishment of the evolution of the Australian democratic state. He says the emotion behind the Yes campaign is about guilt and that the contemporary society should not be responsible for past injustices. McCusker is a man of great influence in Western Australia. His message is able to penetrate because of the pervasive ignorance on the part of so many non-Aboriginal people about our national history. The recognition of First Nations peoples through the proposed constitutionally enshrined voice is not about guilt. It is about a simple recognition of inclusion and owning a history that is incomplete and truthful, is that is complete and truthful. Mandela famously said at the end of the apartheid addressing white South Africans, if you don't want to feel guilty, we don't want you to feel guilty for what has happened, but feel guilty if you want to perpetuate it. In Australia, it's about changing the white blindfolded version of history, as Senator Patrick Dodson so aptly described, so it is that we can make Australia a better nation. Until that happens, Australia is not the envy of the world, as Malcolm Cusker thinks we currently are. This website is an important contribution to truth-telling, which this nation must commit to regardless of the outcome of the referendum. I believe it demonstrates the potential for a national project to record local stories, histories, 
that have been handed down to First Nations peoples throughout Australia. There are many stories to tell, like the stories of the, of the image we've seen there of Jimmy Clements and John Noble, who in 1927 walked over 150 kilometres to attend the opening of Canberra's first Parliament House. They came to remind white Australia that their sovereign rights had not been ceded. I was in Gundagai campaigning on Saturday, handing out pamphlets in the main street with a couple of friends. But I think I'll let you guess what the majority of the reaction was. But ironically, across the road was the larger-than-life bronze sculpture commemorating two Wiradjuri men, Yari and Jackie Jackie, uh, and I guess that's not their proper names, given the, in, in the way it's told in history, who had saved 68 people in the great floods of 1852 a third of the population at that time. How do you juxtapose today's circumstances knowing this history, other than to say people don't know their history and perhaps don't want to know the truth, but that in itself would be an entirely another discussion. Without a grounded understanding and appreciation of our past, our democratic foundations are vulnerable to mad conspiracy theories and misinformation. And we are, obviously, we are currently seeing that in the debate. This project highlights that this referendum proposal did not simply come about out of a national convention at Uluru in 2017. We stand here today on the shoulders of countless peoples who have fought over many decades for First Nations to be recognised within the fabric of the Australian nation state. While I commend the Australian Dictionary of Bi Biography Editorial Board for developing this innovative quest for Indigenous recognition project in support of the voice referendum, and I look forward to reading the material on the website, this project reminds me that history is not static. It is forever changing and incorporating new ideas about designing better ways to tell our future stories, which prompts me to ask the question, do we always want to be telling our children and grandchildren about other people's stories about our nation's history? Or do we tell the stories about how we were involved in changing our history? If you were to imagine for a moment such an initiative being built on this to include ordinary Australians sharing their stories today as part of a national oral history project on a facility like this, it could be the beginnings of the truth-telling process envisaged under the proposed Makarata Commission. I'll leave you with that thought and thanks to all of you who've been involved in developing this project. Thank you. Kalia. Thank you so much, Peter, for those powerful and inspiring words. I'm very pleased now to introduce Mr. Julian Lisa. Uh, Julian is the Liberal member for Barara in the House of Representatives and until April this year was Shadow Minister for Indigenous Australians. Mr. Lisa has a long record as a strong advocate for the Uluru Statement and for constitutional reform. Thank you, Julian. Welcome. Thank you, Tom, and let me begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples on whose land we meet and pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging. Can I thank Paul Howes for uh, his beautiful welcome to country. Uh, I always learn so much from him and it's beautiful the way in which uh, uh, he's constantly teaching us, as he teaches his own people, something of the traditional language of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples. I want to acknowledge Tom Griffiths, Melanie Nolan and my friend Peter Yu. Um, for the wonderful work that they've been doing. This invitation for me to speak tonight came from Mark McKenna. Uh, back in the 1990s, uh, Mark McKenna was teaching at the University of New South Wales. And one of the thing about, things about being a student at the University of New South Wales is you have to do a subject called general studies. Uh, it's like a core curriculum program for everyone. And the most popular general studies um, subject was always Mark McKenna's Mass Media and Communications. And I had the privilege of being one of his students back, uh, uh, back then. And uh, it, was, it was a very exciting course. So it's wonderful to see you here tonight, Mark. It's wonderful to see all of my parliamentary colleagues here, including my friend Linda Burney, the Minister for Indigenous Australians. I wondered if I might ask um, the authors who've contributed, um, who are here tonight, if they might raise their hands. I'd like everybody to give them a round of applause. <laughs> uh, 
as Peter Yu says, they've done something really important here. They've reminded us uh, that the journey towards constitutional recognition didn't begin at Uluru, um, that there is a much longer history of this. And uh, to get a long sense that this has been something that Indigenous people have been looking for, I think this I think makes this such an extremely important project. And I'm envious uh, of the contributors for having put down their stake in terms of telling the next phase uh, of our history. I believe the Australian Dictionary of Biography is a national treasure. Since 1958, it's involved 4,500 authors and researchers giving of their time to tell the stories of Australia. The ADB is meticulous, it's thorough, it's definitive. You've even got an entry in there by me on Bill McMahon, uh, a strange person perhaps to write an entry uh, about in the Dictionary of Biography, but it, it taught me how exacting the standards were that the ADB provides. Importantly, the dictionary is now telling, as Professor Nolan said, uh, more Indigenous stories. The work of the Australian Dictionary of Biography is an ongoing work because the story of Australia is an ongoing story. It will never be completed. It's made up of the stories of people. A country is more than lines on a map. And being one people is about the experiences we share, the values we hold, and the stories we tell. ANU, through this project, are demonstrating their understanding of that. And the quest for Indigenous recognition is about, in, is about telling the story of recognition over the past century, to give people perspective to this moment. This is a powerful moment for our country. It's a moment of meaning. It's a moment of consequence. As the great Australian balladeer Paul Kelly wrote in his new anthem, If Not Now, which is about the referendum, how long can we keep walking with a stone in our shoe? If not now, then when? If not us, then who? We may never get another chance like this again. If not us, then who? If not now, then when? Kelly's drawing from my tradition, from Pirkei Avot, literally translated as the wisdom of the fathers, from the first century Rabbi Hillel, who wrote, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? If I'm not for myself, sorry, if I'm only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? And every time somebody said that in the context of this debate, I thought about Hillel. They were questions on my mind as well earlier this year. And for me, that meant being able to look my children in the eye, to tell them that you have to stand for things in life, even when they cost you. I draw great strength from the many stories you've assembled in the quest for recognition. It was wonderful to read Linda Burney's contribution, as well as the contribution of my friend, Senator Andrew Bragg, who reminds us that the first attempt at constitutional recognition was actually made by John Howard. The articles are a reminder that history is never linear, that there are many disappointments along the way. The Churchill's aphorism is perhaps um, opposite at this point, that success is not final, failure is not fatal, it's the courage to continue that counts. And that's the lesson of Australia. Our history was driven by the most unlikely people. I've been engaged with the debates over constitutional recognition since 1998, and there are many in this room who've been engaged for much longer. For me, it's been a journey that started from the legal forms of the words and the theoretical to the deeply personal. It's become personal as I've listened to the stories of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians. So many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians have become my friends. People like Ken Wyatt, people like Pat Dodson, who we all miss so much in this debate, and my friend Linda Burney. And it's become personal as I've listened to Australians I've met along the way. Last Friday I was in Adelaide. It was the end of the day and people were rushing for their weekend commute. And an Aboriginal man came up to me with a big smile. He took off his headphone, he unzipped his jacket and he had a big Aboriginal flag on it. He'd been a signatory to the Uluru Statement. He wanted to thank me for supporting the Yes campaign and he told me what it meant to him. As I've met Aboriginal people around the country, I've heard not only what, Uluru, what at Uluru was called the torment of our powerlessness, I've also seen their love of this country, the yearning to contribute, to make it better. It's a yearning that saw that great Yorta Yorta man, William Cooper, petition the King for places here in the Federal Parliament. And it saw Jimmy Clements and John Noble, as we see in the, in the pictures, walk for days from the Brungle Mission to be here in Canberra for the opening of the first Parliament House in 1927. It's a yearning that sparked petitions and protests, walks and gatherings. It's a yearning to participate a yearning to participate so the gap can close, where Aboriginal people can have power over their destiny, 
so that their children can walk in two worlds and flourish. And to take hold of our parliamentary democracy as a fellow citizen and inheritor of this land. As we seek to amend our constitution this October, it's worth reflecting what the framers of the constitution sought to do a century and a quarter ago. Yes, they sought to deliver a system of government with parliamentary representation, the rule of law and the delineation of powers under the crown. But they were trying to do something much deeper. And that was to create one people out of six. The preamble has the famous words, the people agreed to unite, to create a country of one people. This referendum is about continuing that work, to become one people. And we do that by be being willing to listen to each other. I started this year with a speech to the Young Liberals where I spoke about the voice and I spoke about empathy. We often think that empathy is about identifying with people who are just like us. But that's not an understanding or a reckoning with difference. It's, it's not true empathy. As I said to the Young Liberals, empathy is much bigger. It's not about accepting and embracing people because we can see ourselves in them. It's about standing with people and their right to dignity, freedom and self-expression when we can't see ourselves in them, when we can't see the similarities. And we must do this as a country. This is a moment of empathy. It's a moment of shared understanding. A moment where we move further in our journey to be one people. Not only one people in terms of the law, but in heart and soul as well. 25 years ago, as we approached the millennium, the great journalist Michelle Grattan put together a book called Reconciliation. It was a wonderful work. In it you can see progress, and in other places you can see none at all. It was still a work for the times, particularly as they relate to the challenges of symbolism and practicality. The interconnectedness of the practical outcome-focused work with the work of the heart and the soul. I was struck by the words of one Indigenous leader who wrote to Michelle Grattan. And this is what they said, and I quote, Healing in Australia is a profound, long-term and incremental thing. It's a tough road. I think we'll get there. It won't be in the next 12 months. It may not be in the next five or six years. But eventually, we will come to an accommodation where we're recognised constitutionally and morally as the first people of Australia. That's what reconciliation is all about. I wonder if you can guess who wrote those words. The author was my friend Linda Burney. When she spoke those words, no Indigenous man and no Indigenous woman had been elected to the House of Representatives. And yet since that time, she and Ken Wyatt have paved the way. Progress happens in fits and starts, and not in ways we ever expect, but it happens as good people make choices to change and to advance our country. A quarter of a century on from Linda's words, that journey continues. It's not a journey of one or two, but it's the journey of a country, the journey of a people who share a continent and a title, Australia. The journey continues, and I hope that we will take the next step in that journey on Saturday the 14th of October. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, and for those wonderfully heartening words, and thank you for being here tonight. It's now my great pleasure to introduce the Honourable Linda Burney, uh, who is the Minister for Indigenous Australians. And as you know, Linda is um, greatly admired uh, and renowned for her warm, compassionate and visionary leadership in her portfolio, and especially now as we approach the referendum. Thank you, Minister, for being here with us tonight. Warm and compassionate. I'll remember that as I'm speaking tonight, so thank you. Uh, can I first of all uh, thank Paul for his, his welcome, but also reminding us of uh, the story of Jimmy Clements and John Noble, both um, Peter and Julian have referred to, to those men. And I spoke about Jimmy Clements in my inaugural speech to the parliament, um, and it really struck me very deeply that my father is from Brungle, and so is Jimmy Clements and John Noble, so we were probably related, but I don't actually know that. But um, 
uh, they really um, did something incredible that day and uh, did not have shoes. So uh, extraordinary men um, and an extraordinary display of identity, of strength and of um, uh, stoicism. Well, I will not do as, as someone, I think um, Peter spoke about Malcolm Acosta, and I am just going to acknowledge the Nambri and the Ngunnawal people from Canberra, and the rest can look after themselves. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Tom, for the introduction. And um, I'd like to also recognize all of you here this evening, particularly the contributors and all First Nations people who have gathered from all parts of the southern sky. Can I recognize Peter? And thank you, Peter, for your words. Um, and to Melanie as well. Uh, I'll come back to Melanie in a moment. But I'd also like to thank very deeply Julian for his words. And I wish I could be as well researched and organized as you are, Julian. But, um, but I'm not. But I really do appreciate the, your sentiments and the thought that you've put in uh, both you and Peter and Melanie to what you would say this evening. In my view, everyone, there has been an extraordinary change in our nation. And this project represents that change. Uh, I am probably as old as uh, the oldest person in the room. And I have to say that what I have noticed profoundly about Australia is that there is now, and it didn't exist a few years ago, but there is now a desire for truth and a desire for knowledge. That is new. And it's come about because of all of the things that Peter and Julian and Melanie has spoken, have spoken about. It's come about because uh, we are growing up. And it's come about because people understand over a very, very long period of time, uh, decades actually, uh, the call for truth. And the fact that in some states and territories, uh, these processes have started in a very formal way. And I really want to commend uh, this project because it is part of that national process of truth telling. I mean, there is the, the catchphrase, of course, that truth liberates. And it's true. It is true. Uh, and as uh, the quote from Nelson Mandela said, it is not about apportioning blame. It is not about apportioning guilt at all. It is about all of us sharing the truth of the story of this country. And in many ways, that's what the Uluru Statement says. And that's what this referendum is about. It's about recognizing 65,000 years of story and that is something that we all should celebrate as Australians. It is something that we all must be proud of. It is something that is ours, uh, yours and mine and everyone else that no other country can boast about. And that to me uh, is something absolutely extraordinary. Can I also say that uh, I know that there is a lot of very hard work uh, that's gone to this project and, it's, uh, uh, and to gather up the stories of this country is remarkable. I've often thought to myself, you know, that each and every one of us has a story. And I've told this uh, before, but I remember 
being in a yarning circle and we were talking about our stories and I don't think Australians are very good at talking about themselves. Uh, but there was a woman who said, oh, my life's really boring, I've got nothing to tell. Uh, you know, I'm married, I live in the Insula Peninsula and um, I've got three kids. But talking through with her, extraordinary. She was carried out of Europe, part, part of Europe, I think it was um, um, Hungary, by her grandmother on her back ahead of the Nazis. Now that's a story. So it's about valuing your story, but it's also being truthful about, about it as well. And when you think of the extraordinary events of our nation, uh, as Julian said, the William Cooper petition in the 30s, the Yerikala Bach petitions, which you can see in this place in the 60s, the Barunga Statement in the 80s, and the many significant moments, whether it's the Redfern speech, whether it's the apology, whether it's weak, whether it's land rights, there is a story in this country that says very clearly that Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders have been advocating for our rights for a very long time. But in the case of people like William Cooper, advocating also for the rights of others. And my point there, everyone, is that we are a better nation. We are a more honest nation when the rights of First Nations people are recognised because it makes it the right, the uh, recognition by everyone. There has been much talk about the referendum tonight, but let me just say this, is that it is about truth through the recognition piece. It's about listening by the establishment of a voice. And it's about better results because of that voice. Now, it just seems remarkable to me that Australia would say no to an advisory committee. And that's what we are really talking about in this very simple form on October the 14th. So in launching this extraordinary project, I cannot underscore what it means to the country, what it means to individuals, and what it will lead to. It is all of those things. So I want you all to say yes on October the 14th. I want you to understand the consequences of no. And it is now or never. The question is simple. The Voice will give advice on key issues and all the things I talked about. The time is now to make a practical difference in the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Every Australian can vote and be part of making a difference. Help us answer the call of decades of Indigenous voices. Just as the quest for Indigenous Recognition Project powerfully illustrates by saying yes, yes to the Uluru Statement, yes to a voice, and yes to a better future. I am very honoured to launch this amazing project. Thank you so much, Minister, for your gracious and inspiring words and for launching this project and website, for reminding us uh, of the opportunity uh, that we have in this moment. One of the reasons we research and write history is to understand the present. It is to understand uh, the um, exhilarating precipice upon which we are poised at this moment, to grasp the opportunities of the future that are before us. Thank you 
all our speakers tonight. Thank you for, to all of our authors for working with us in creating this uh, website. Please um, go to the website, enjoy it, read it, spread the word about it, and help us elaborate it in the weeks and months and years to come. We can make it even better and stronger. Uh, we're just thrilled that you're able to join us this evening to celebrate this project. Thank you and good evening.